Well, good evening. Good to see you guys. Let's turn to Psalm 139 tonight. Back to our psalm and prayer night. Been a good long Christmas season. How many of you guys are still singing Christmas songs out there? All right. Just a few of you guys out there still believe it's Christmas, Pastor Kevin, because it is still Christmas. I've made a decision that next year, some way, somehow, I'm going to figure out how to have something happen every night between Christmas and New Year's. Because Christmas, I mean, it's over in one day. I mean, all that work, all that toil and labor and you ladies shopping in the malls and sleeping in the malls and all that for one day? No way. I mean, the 12 days of Christmas, I think that'd be something we could incorporate. Amen? You just keep on celebrating until you finally get tired of it. You finally get tired of all the food. Even Pastor Steve just said, no more food, no more of that. Bet me. Ham sandwich tonight. Amen? <laughs> I was there. So anyhow, good, good, good. I love Christmas. Um, Psalm 139 tonight. How many of you guys came in tonight and actually ask the Lord in a sense, Lord, what do you want to speak to me tonight about? Did you ask that question? Seriously, Lord, I'm coming tonight. Or, or maybe it was just you walked through the door, oh, I'll just go see what happens, see, see what somebody has to say. Maybe Pastor Steve will be here tonight, maybe not, you know. <laughs> but you know what? It is so important that you do ask that question, that you, you come in and you, you have a purpose in coming to a Bible study, um, because the Holy Spirit has a plan. And, and just to encourage you, as you look into God's Word, remember, remember that this Bible, all these words, they're, they're a love letter written to who? To me and to you. By who? The Holy Spirit. Now, yes, there's authors who wrote these, who, remember, were inspired by the Holy Spirit. And some of them tell stories, some of these books tell prophecies of what's to come and, and stories of the children of Israel and all the history and such and the poetry and then of course the gospels and the letters from the apostle Paul. Um, real people writing real letters and such, real books. But remember, this word is written for me and for you to take and to read. And, and so tonight we're going to look at this psalm. By the way, how many are familiar with Psalm 139? Not too, too many of you. But I'm going to tell you what, this is a keeper. And I, I pray my heart for you tonight is that when you leave tonight, this one will be bookmarked, underlined. Um, you will know the address because it's so, so important, the, uh, the context, the application of what David is writing. But the idea, of course, is reading God's Word, remembering that it's, it's personally written by the Spirit of God, to me and you, to apply to our lives. Now, the, we have this thing that's called, you know, observation, okay? Let's, let's read it, what was happening, what was going on. Then you have the interpretation. Sometimes we've got to interpret what is being said. Some words like, what's that mean, or what is that all about, whatever. So you've got this interpretation. But then you have the application. And if there's no application, it's just like another book. And the application, and that's where Pastor Steve's ministry is so great, is that he teaches much of the application into our personal lives in, in circumstances and situations. You have other pastors out there who might be great teachers, expositors, who are, well, this, the Hebrew says this, and the Greek says this, you know, potluckus, you know, is what we did for Christmas. I mean, it's a little joke there, folks. I mean, <laughs> you had the Greek, all that kind of stuff, which is cool. It's good. It's great. Um, but if it doesn't apply to my life, it doesn't do something that applies to the circumstance and situation going on in my life, then what? It's got to do something to me. And remember, anytime you read God's Word, that's what it's there for. It's neat to study. It's neat to get all into it and everything. But, okay, Lord, what did you speak to me this morning about me, my life, my circumstances, my sin, my situations, my trials, whatever? So tonight, Psalm 139 a great, great psalm. The uh, title of the message tonight, When God Seems Hidden. And this psalm here is a declaration from David, written, they believe, um, in his older years because it's a reflection upon David's life and his relationship with this transcendent, awe-inspiring, incredible, undescribable God that really who desires a personal relationship with me and you through the person of Jesus Christ. And it's amazing, though, when you think about 
what David is saying here and the whole idea that this God who, who flung the universe into existence and holds it all together in the power and the might, yet when we finish tonight, you're going to see through this psalm that he knows you and he knows me so incredibly intimately that it's, 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 it's beyond comprehension. David says in verse 6, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. I can't fathom it. It's high. I cannot attain it. I can't understand it. It's just, it's above me to believe and to know that this is the God that I love and I serve. And why is this so important? Maybe you're here tonight and you're in a situation where it's, man, God, are you even there? And you may not be in a circumstance tonight, but you might be tomorrow. And three situations came to my mind as I was preparing to study tonight. The story of the, the young teenage girl in um, Littleton, Colorado at Arapahoe High School, Claire Davis, 17 years old, minding no business, Friday the 13th. You know the story? The crazy gunman, the, the poor lost kid, shoots her. So for eight days, her family agonizes and waits and prays and prays and prays and prays. And I remember reading a story on Saturday the 21st that she had passed away. And no doubt during that time, and maybe even now, the question comes, man, Lord, where were you? And, and the parents, family members may be feeling that, man, their, their way, their life, their situation is hidden from God. Or I just found out who it was, maybe you heard about Thursday, about the young man who drove his car off the cliffs there at Bluff Cove in PV. And I got an email today from somebody who knows that, and, and it's the son of the head coach of the football team at Pacific Lutheran High School. And his son was troubled in circumstances and situations there. And, and yet I think about that dad who no doubt has been praying for his son for how long? For how long? And then now his son is there in the hospital awaiting surgery tomorrow, paralyzed from the chest down. Man, God, is my life hidden from you? Or I'm sure you heard the story of the young man who was shot and killed by the Torrance police there at Madrona Middle School, right by the mall on Thursday. And I was reading the story, and, and it, they're quoting his brother, who quoted his mother, saying that, that this son of hers was was miswired, it seemed, from when he was a kid. How long? And I have no idea what her faith is, if there is any faith. But maybe she believes or thinks that, nah, man, my way is hidden. And even the children of Israel, Isaiah writes there in 41, he says, you know, why do you say, O Jacob, and speak thus, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, or my just claim is passed over by my God? Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord, the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth, he neither slumbers nor sleeps. His understanding is unsearchable. He knows all these things. And tonight as we go through this, this passage of Scripture, and I pray that it goes fast enough where we can get time to where we can come here and pray and allow people to pray for you and, and anoint you and, and to pray to those circumstances and situations. But I hope that we leave here tonight absolutely 100% convinced that, hey, you may not know how it's all going to work out, but you're going to know that your God knows you so well. He knows everything about you. He knows what's going on in your life. And, and it's just amazing when you read this. So the first main point here in verse 1 through 6, God, you know my life. David says here, oh, Lord, you have searched me and known me. It's like God has taken this MRI or this PET scan, and he has scanned you. And that's what David is saying, you've searched me. He's watched, he's studied, he knows. And because God is able to do that, you know me. Completely like nobody else in the universe. Greater than anybody else in this planet, God knows you. He has searched you and he knows you. And the crazy thing is that he still allows us to come before him. Because he knows your heart, he knows your mind, he knows your thoughts. The good and the not so good. Oh, Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path 
and my lying down. You're acquainted with all my ways. And NASB translation says you are intimately acquainted with all my ways. It says you know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. God knows the inward and he knows the outward. He, he sees exactly. He saw you get into your car tonight to, to get here to church. He saw when you got out of bed this morning. He will see when you go to bed tonight. On top of that, he knows your thoughts. He says, you understand my thoughts afar off. He discerns. You comprehend my path. He knows where you're going. He knows you're lying down. He knows when you're going to go to sleep tonight. All these things, every single thing about your life. God, you know my life. He is there. He discerns where you're going. He knows you're lying down. He's acquainted. He knows your thoughts. And this idea of knowing your thoughts also, though, is he knows the motives behind them. He knows all that's happening and the reasons why. And this one here just blows me away. And there is, for there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it all together. Now turn to the person next to you and just start talking about Christmas real quick. Just go ahead, turn, turn and start talking. Go ahead, talk. It's okay to talk in church right now. Talk to somebody. Okay, hey, you're talking. Weather was good. Christmas is nice and everything. Okay. Every single one of your words, before they left your mouth, guess who knew those? According to what David said. So if he knows the words that are going to come out before they even come out, that means he knows my thoughts. How does he do that? Not just us in this room, but everyone. There is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it all together. It's amazing. He knows my inward life. He knows my outward life. And he still loves us. And David here reflecting, you have hedged me behind and before. You've encompassed me. You've you put your hand around me. You laid your hand upon me. You've blessed my life. David reflecting, man, verse 6, ah, this is amazing. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. I can't fathom it. I can't comprehend it. It blows my mind, so to speak. And this, of course, all speaks of God's omniscience. He is all-knowing, you guys. He knows my life. Not a word and such knowledge. Man, God knows your life. He knows what time you're going to get up tomorrow. He knows how many times you're going to hit the snooze button. He knows when you're going to get up. He knows your path to work. He knows the plan tomorrow. All these things about our God knowing me and you. And, and understand that David is writing this from the perspective of not of a fear of God like, oh, no, God, you know everything about me? There's some in this room that are glad that some people don't know everything about you. Amen? Wasn't too many amens there. God knows it, you guys. He knows it. And I don't want to turn the study negative to the point where it's just, you know, but a man, the Holy Spirit is convicting and speaking to you. Understand, he knows everything about your life. He knows what you're trying to get away with. He knows what you're trying to do. He knows the path you're going down. He knows the destruction that it's going to cause. Stop. Let him speak. Hear his voice tonight. Turn from it. God, omniscient, all-knowing. And the second thing we see here in our passage, in our chapter, is that verse 7 through 12, that God, you know my ways. He knows my life. But now he knows my way. This speaks of God's omnipresence. He says in verse 7, where can I go from your spirit or where can I flee from your presence? And remember, David writing this from the perspective of this is a great and awesome God. He knows everything about my life. He knows where I'm going. And guess what? There's no place that I can go that he is not there. No place. And even if I tried to hide from him, didn't a man named Jonah, somebody named Jonah in the book of the Bible, learn that lesson the hard way? How many have learned that lesson the hard way? You can't get away from God. He's always where you are. This, this idea, this omnipresence means that God is everywhere present all the time. Always with you and with me, any place, every place. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell or Sheol, behold, you are there. The idea here David is saying is just the, the, the idea of the height and the depth. 
There's no place high or low that I can go. Not that David would ever want to make his bed in hell. But behold, you are there. And in reality, God created it all anyhow. And God, Jesus, was in Sheol. Remember the, the holding place, in a sense, before Christ came for all the saints and all the sinners. And he came and he preached to the captives and set captivity free and took with them those who were righteous by faith to heaven with him and left the others for judgment to come. He is everywhere. Can't get away from him. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea. I remember my uh, middle son, Kellen, he was in the Coast Guard and having a tough time away from home, away from family, out in the middle of the ocean. Now, of course, his, his patrol area at the time was, uh, he was stationed in Key West. Pretty tough place to be, amen? And yet he would go out and he would cruise through all the islands, through Cuba, Columbia, all around out there, out in the middle of nowhere, sending me pictures of this nothing but sea and ocean. And I remember sending him this scripture, this verse here. If I take the wings in the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, David's saying, no matter where you go, how far you go, out in the ocean, you think you're going to get away from everybody and everything and anything. And quite frankly, out in the middle of the ocean, you're out there. But God is right there. Verse 10, even there. I love that. Even there. Even there. And no matter where you find your life today, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, even though I'm there, even though, even there God is. Even though you may be in the valley of the shadow of death, you may be in a situation, you may find yourself in a place tonight where you feel like, God, do you even care? Do you even know what's going on in my life? Because you may have been struggling, you've been trying to get a job for so long, it's crazy, or you've been praying to get married and, and you're older than me, quite frankly. How long? God, do you even care? Do you even know? Even there, his hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. What kind of God is this who is so close to us? No matter where you find yourself in your life, even there, he's there. I love it. Going on to say, verse 11, if I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light about me. Even if the darkness, in a sense, I feel hides me from God. Or maybe I'm trying to escape, and I think that in the darkness, like a kid, you know, you just close your eyes, and pff, there's nobody going to be able to get you, because they can't see you. You get it all mixed up, of course. But maybe even in your darkness, in your life circumstance, you think that God can't see. No, 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 no. Even the night shall be light about me. Indeed, verse 12 says, the darkness shall not hide from you or me from you, is what he's saying. But the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. And of course, God, he's outside of our time. It's only dark outside. Why? Because this little ball that we're on is turning. I mean, the sun is still shining, just not on this side of the planet. And if we were to pop off this planet and go hang out, you know, maybe close to the moon or something, the sun is always there. Now, if we get behind the earth, of course, you understand that. I mean, but the idea is that, that we can't go anywhere that God isn't. Darkness doesn't hide God. God doesn't, there's no such thing as darkness to God. And even in your darkness, he's light. And he wants to bring light into your situation. And so we see here that God knows my ways. And I think of Joseph, and you think of this guy. And you guys, you all almost know, you know the story of Joseph. Started off 17 years old, and his buddies, <laughs> his brothers throw him into the pit, and he's sold to the Midianites, and they take him into Egypt, and he's sold to Potiphar. Well, from the time that all began to the time he finally stands before Pharaoh and kind of starts figuring these things out, of, like why, God, you're doing this, 13 years go by. Do you think maybe in that time, how, you know, and we only get the, really the, you know, most of the good stuff that is recorded. But how, wonder what he thought there in the pit. Man, man, God, you hate me. Why would you do this to me? Okay, so he gets pulled out of the pit and he goes, all right, he's doing pretty good in Potiphar's house. And, and, and he's, God is with them. And then what happens? You know the story. He gets thrown in prison. How long is he in prison for? Two more years? And on top of that, 
you know, he tells the dream interpretation for the butler and the baker, and, and you know, the butler, I mean, the baker forgets to talk about him because he don't have a head no more, so he can't really talk. But the butler forgets to tell Pharaoh about him to get him out of prison. Two years he sits there, he languishes in prison. My way is hidden. No, God was with Joseph the whole entire time. God knew his ways. God had a plan. So cool to see. But 13 years, that's a long time. I mean, how many of you have even been saved 13 years and the things you're going through? I think about Moses himself as well, thinking that God has hidden himself from Moses. We, we read about Moses and we, you know, we really focus on the last 40 years of Moses' life and his time in the wilderness and the children of Israel. But remember, the first 40 years, he's in Egypt. He's right there in Pharaoh's house, and he's got all kinds of power and everything he wants. And yet, you know how many verses talk or really kind of are an expression of the 40 years in the desert? Ten verses. 40 years? Imagine Moses. Imagine 40 years. I haven't even been saved 40 years. I'm not even 40 years old. <laughs> You guys, that's not even right. <laughs> but the idea is that 40 years, he's out there. What happened in that 40 years? How often did he question God? Did, oh, you think about that. And in our own lives, how long? How long? Man, if we're going through a trial for a day, man, God, you've abandoned me. You hate me. Everything's gone. Miles are just chucking, you know, throwing the towel in this Christianity thing. No. Oh. He knows our days. He knows our thoughts. He knows our life. Amazing. And then moving on, verse 13 through 16, it says, God, you do know my days. So we talked about God's omniscience, omnipresence, but now we see God's omnipotence and his power, all powerful. And I love this passage of scripture here. It's so incredible. He says here, for you formed my inward parts. So, so David is, is this claiming, not only God, you know my life, everything about what's going on outwardly. You know my ways. You know what? I, I can't get away from you. You see everything about me, which is a good thing. And then on top of that, David says, now, you, the God of the universe, you created this. For you formed my inward parts, and you covered me in my mother's womb. And if, if you're looking for the verses that really um, speak so much against Abortion and the idea that, well, until the baby actually comes from the womb, it's just a fetus, it's just nothing, it's a non-existent piece of flesh, bone and such. Right here. You formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. The marvelous are your works and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth, David is speaking of the lowest parts of the earth in the womb. No, no, no. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. And in your book, they all were written, the days fashioned for me when as yet there was none of them. Can you even believe that? That every single day of your life was written in God's book before you ever were even born in that moment of conception? That's when it began. That's when God saw you and he saw me in this creation. And it's amazing to see how science is just continually trying to prove evolution in a sense of, of trying to figure out life somewhere else. And, and I heard the most ridiculous hypothesis. And yet once a scientist says it, you know, of course, it goes into the school books and it's, it's you know, it's gospel. That, that, that back when, of course, the dinosaurs were wiped out. It's when that big, gigantic asteroid hit the Earth, right? And it just wiped everything out. Well, the hypothesis now is that, well, how did, because they think there's maybe possibly, you know, water on Mars, and, and not only on Mars, but also on Europa, the, the moon there of Jupiter. Well, here's how they figured it out. Simple. This big asteroid hits this big chunk of dirt called Earth, right? And when it hits this big chunk of dirt, why, what happens is that chunk, chunk of dirt gets life on it, water and cells and bacteria, whatever, but then it bounces off Earth. You think I'm kidding? Just Google this, okay? Bounces off the Earth and then goes out back into the universe, so to speak, back into our galaxy, and it just miraculously runs into Mars 
and it runs into this moon, Europa, on, in Jupiter. Gee, makes sense to me. Right in the book. And, and yet, amazing enough to actually try and really believe evolution, that we came from the one nothing, you know, goo to the zoo kind of a thing. And, and, and yet, when you look at the human body, I, I wrote this down. It's so amazing. 100 trillion cells in your body. And a billion of them are replaced like every, I don't know, 10 minutes or so. 206 bones, 22 organs. Your heart beats two and a half billion times in your lifetime. And also, that there's 100,000 hairs on your head. And who is it who said that he has numbered every single one of those hairs? It starts with a J. Jesus said that in Luke 12. That don't fear. The very hairs of your head are numbered. It was talking about when Jesus himself said that he knows when even a sparrow falls to the ground. How many sparrows are in the world? There's sparrows all over the place. God knows when each one of those hits the ground, when each one dies. This insane idea here. God knows my days. Omnipotent. See, he's powerful enough to create you in this universe. Do you think he's powerful enough to fix the situation in your life? Amen. Amen, he is. It's not a matter of his ability. It is, though, a matter of his will. Why did God not heal Claire Davis? Why didn't God heal the person in your life? And we understand. As hard as it is, though, God didn't want Claire Davis on earth anymore. It was time for this one to go home. And it's time in God's perfect way to work these things out. And that's the tough part, of course. That's subject for another Bible study. But for us here today, tonight, man, man, when you think God is hidden from you, or you can't see him, or you don't know what's going on, or he even is aware of what's happening, don't even buy that lie. Get yourself over to Psalm 139 and read this over and over and over and over again. Powerful enough. You think of the story of Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. 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 That's how you, you can read it that way. But the idea of these guys, Daniel, thrown into the lion's den. Is it some fanciful story or did it really happen? Yes. And yet God was able to hold back those lions from clamping down on Daniel, and yet the, those who threw him in, boom, before they even hit the ground. God powerful enough to do that. God powerful enough to protect Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when they didn't want to bow to Nebuchadnezzar and his idol. What did they say to Nebi? Hey, dude, you can do what you want. We know our God is able to deliver us from whatever it is that you do. And you know the story. That made Nebuchadnezzar mad as a furnace. And he turned the furnace up seven times the heat, made him hot, hot, mad, and turns it up. And those so hot that those who brought Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to the furnace, they burned up, throwing them in the fire. And yet Shadrach, you know the story. They were fine, walking around, hanging out with Jesus in the furnace, in the fire. And that's where you got to remember Jesus is. He hasn't left you, hasn't hidden himself from you. He's completely and totally aware of what's going on in your life. And lastly, the fourth point, verse 17 and 18, I, this is a little different. It says, God, you know your thoughts. See, we see that God knows my life, he knows my ways, he knows my days, but God also knows his thoughts towards us. And it's so amazing. Here, David, how precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, he wouldn't be able to, of course, they would be more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. And this idea, of course, is that, man, we, you know, it's not a dream. David musing, David meditating, David falling in and out of slumber and just, just thinking about this, and he awakes. It's not a dream. This is real. This is reality. This is truth. When, when I awake, it's still the truth. I'm still with you. And because he knows and because he's always with us and because he made us, 
really, in order to accomplish all that David has talked about, it would speak of God having to think of you and me always. How can he do that? Not just you, not just me, but all who call upon the name of the Lord. Jeremiah 29, 11, of course, we love that scripture. We quote it. It says, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you, not of bad, but of good, not of evil, but of good, to plans to give you a future and a hope. And, and that's what we have to, we've got to come to this place where we understand and realize that with God, he, even in our correction, even in our chastisement, even in, in the things that God does that we don't like, when we, you know, quite frankly, get spanked by God, we get taken to the woodshed by God. Even in that, you have to always come to, from the position that God is always good all the time. Even in the midst of a world and a society and circumstances of life that sometimes seem so unbelievably negative and unfair. And no doubt there are those in Claire's family who think, that, wait a minute, God, you, you, know, you crossed the line here. And yet we can't question God that way because God, all-knowing, all-present, understanding and seeing the end from the beginning and such, he had a plan in it. And he has got a plan in your life and my life as well. But understanding that in reading a passage of Scripture like this, what does it do for you in relationship to your God? Man, he knows you. He's with you. He's right there with you right now. Everything that's going on in your life, your thoughts, your words, everything he's intimately acquainted with, that you can literally walk around with your hand like this, and guess who's holding your hand? Who? No, no, you didn't answer that. Who's holding your hand? God, amen. Does that do something for you? Does that help you thinking about when, what you got to face tomorrow, or maybe what you have to face when you go home even tonight? That God is with you. You can't go anywhere without him being there, and that he's thinking of you good and wants the best for your life, and he has favored you, and that word favor, of course, is another word for grace, that it's there. And tonight, as we close in here, I'm going to ask the worship team to come back up, and we're going to go to the communion table. And Pastor Kevin is going to sing a song. I asked him to sing, He Knows My Name. And I want us at this point in time to take time and reflect upon this psalm, this incredible, wonderful psalm of David that was written not by David, so to speak, not just for David either, but it was written by the Holy Spirit for us at such a time as this right now in our lives that you would receive from him. And so as you go now during this song to the communion table, I'm going to ask Pastor Kevin to, to sing it a few times through so you can hear the words and you can get to the communion table and you can sit there and you can hold the bread and hold the juice and just praise your God for who he is. This God who David says, man, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I can't even comprehend it. It's just, just crazy to think that this God knows all this stuff and he knows me and he's with me. And the crazy thing is he really knows me. And if you really knew me, you probably wouldn't really want to hang around me. Honestly, because we're all what? Our hearts are wicked, the Bible says. Our th of all that stuff, and then we're just human. And yet God, no, loves us, wants to be with us, wants us as his special people, never to leave our side, never to turn away from us, never to abandon us, but always to walk with us. Man, David just like, ah, just meditating. Wakes up, oh, it's got to be a dream. No, no dream. When I wake, I am still with him. When I awake, this is still the truth. And of course, you can just rewrite this and rewrite this and go through that whole process, praising our God and thanking him for who he is. Amen.